The negligent tort. The strict liability tort. Tort law two. Introduction to law. Law and jurisprudence. Spring semester 2015. Dr. Peter Baxter. Well, as you could tell, my voice isn't much better than it was before, but I hope you could bear up uh, with me and we will complete <clears throat> this section on tort law. As you remember, there are three basic areas of tort. Intentional tort, that sounds a lot and looks a lot like criminal law. Negligent tort, that most people mistake for tort. They believe all torts are negligence, which they're not. And the third category, strict liability tort. Well, in this lecture series, part two, we will look at the final two categories. The negligent tort. Negligence is defined as an act or actionable omission to act by defendant that shows no or low duty of care or have breached some duty of care and that uh, breach of duty of care was the actual or proximate cause of the damage to the plaintiff. So, as I promised before, the negligent tort looks at the duty of care and the breach of that duty of care. The most known or renowned area of negligent tort of negligence is malpractice. Malpractice is tort or breach of duty done by somebody who is certified, who has special training, like a doctor, uh, an ophthalmologist, um, a dentist, a lawyer. Uh, these are all professionals. <clears throat> and when the tort is done, the negligence is done by a professional, we call it malpractice. Now, what is the duty of care? Everyone owes a duty of care as a reasonable person. And the number one duty of care is to yourself. From the common law, we understand that everyone owes a duty of care to themselves. But the duty of care is measured by the same or similar circumstance. For instance, a person of the same age, duty of care, a person of the same disability or ability and possessing the same array of knowledge or skills. Now, before we get to liability rules, you have to understand that everyone owes a duty of care to what is known as habitual trespassers. Habitual trespassers. These are individuals who are likely to come upon your land. Invitees, people that you invite or public entrance, government officials like police officers, tax assessors, and firefighters. Well, who could be habitual trespassers? Children, of course, can be habitual trespassers. But you could also have salespeople, meter readers, a Jehovah Witness. So you owe a duty of care to anyone who might enter your expectation of privacy, your land. Okay? You owe a special duty of care to children. Uh, child trespassers are especially uh, to be considered what's known as uh, being brought into your land by the attractive nuisance. Children you owe a special duty of care to because they come to the attractive nuisance. The swimming pool, for instance. You could live and work as an attorney in Florida merely doing um, merely doing cases concerning swimming pools. <coughs> As this is an attractive nuisance to most children. Okay? Now, there are certain liability rules for specialized activities. The common law rule basically states that you owe a duty to no one except yourself. The common law rule, though, has been expanded to anyone to whom you have a statutory or a special relationship with. For instance, you owe duty to yourself, to family members, to people living in your house, 
to people to which you're contracted with, to your students. That is uh, by special relationship. You have a duty not to place them into an emergency. Okay? You owe also a duty to those in such special relationships as employer-employee. You as an employer owe a duty to employees. And you have a duty not to place them in an emergency. Here we meet the Good Samaritan obligation, a biblical reference to the Good Samaritan. Basically, how it works is, even if you do not owe a duty to a plaintiff, but you undertake the care of that plaintiff, you must return that person to the same or better condition from which you found them. So, to put it another way, if you undertake the protection of another or the rescue of another, you must place them in the same or better position than when, what you found them in. You find somebody whose house is on fire. You should, if you undertake to rescue them from the fire, you must place them in safety, in a better position. So if you take them from a house fire and you put them in a oil refa- uh, refinery file, fire, you violate your Good Samaritan obligation. You put them in a worse position. So you have to put them in a similar or better situation than once you found them. Only if you violate the Good Samaritan obligation will you be found liable. So say, for instance, one of you undergo some cardiac problems and you pass out, your heart stopped, and I undertake your care. Well, I have no specialized ability. I'm a doctor, but not that kind of doctor. So uh, I go to restart your heart by doing, you know, uh, resuscitation. And I break one of your ribs, but you're alive. Have I fulfilled my Good Samaritan obligation? You have a broken rib. But the answer is yes, I have. Because before you were dead, now you're alive. So you're in a better situation, even with a broken rib. People who are dead with broken ribs don't get to complain because they're dead. So I have fulfilled a good Samaritan obligation. Now, one other aspect I want to come back to is the idea of proximate cause. Proximate cause is really a policy determination that's been made by the court. It's otherwise known as legal cause. Actual cause is when I directly cause your harm. Proximate cause is when I set forth circumstances that result in your harm. So, um, I might, I don't know, um, place grease on the ground, then place a ladder on that grease then I ask you to climb that ladder and you go skidding off and injure yourself. Well, you could then apply the but-for test as we learned about in the last lecture series. Was my actions a contributory factor to your harm? And the answer in the scenario I just gave you is yes, it is. So I was proximately... I proximately caused your harm. The grease plus ladder on grease plus person on ladder results in injured person falling off ladder. Now one other item here is foreseeability. When you measure proximate cause and apply the but for test, were my actions foreseeable? By putting grease, I don't know why anyone would put grease at the bottom of a ladder. But, so be it. Was it foreseeable by placing the ladder on the grease? Injury was more likely. And the answer is yes, because it's foreseeable. A causes B, which causes C. And if that relationship, A to C, is foreseeable... You are the proximate cause, otherwise known as the legal cause. Now, say I just walked up to the ladder, assume no grease. I walk up to the ladder and I shove you off the ladder. 
it's not a question of proximate. It's not a question of foreseeability. I actually caused your harm. I directly, not proximately, caused your harm. Now, when we talk about foreseeability or proximate, we talk about intervening and indirect causation. A is the uh, independent variable. B is the intervening variable. C is the dependent variable. Does A cause C? The answer is no. It's indirect causation through B. Thus, B is an intervening variable. A causes B, which in turn causes C. So it's not a direct causal link. If it was a direct causal link, we'd talk about actual harm. It's an indirect causal link. It's a proximate link. A proximately causes C because it acts upon B. Continuing on with negligent torts, we run into the issue again of contributory negligence and remember, the early common law standard was if you contributed even one iota, one percentage to, you, to the harm, you were barred from collecting from the tortfeasor. This is pure contributory negligence. We no longer have this as a matter of modern American law. But we do have simple contributory negligence where I would have to be more than half responsible for my own harm to be barred from collecting. Why? Well, because I assumed the risk. We want people to act according to their first tort duty to yourself. We don't want individuals assuming risk to themselves like the bungee cord jumper there you see. But if they do so, we might want to bar them from collecting because they assume the risk. Okay? Simply falling down a stair, uh, ca uh, staircase, they might not have assumed the risk. It might have been faulty construction or faulty maintenance of the staircase. But when you tie a bungee cord to your feet and jump off a bridge, you've assumed a hell of a lot of risk. Today, the modern contributory negligence standard is you had to be more than half responsible to your own harm. You've had to have had assumed more than half the risk to be barred from collecting. Now, today, about 25% of all jurisdictions in the United States are modern contributory negligence. We don't have any jurisdictions left that are pure contributory negligence, 75% of the jurisdictions out there are comparative negligence jurisdictions. This is where the court, the judge, guesstimates a percentage. For instance, the bungee cord manufacturer might be 20% negligent. The bungee cord purveyor, the one who tied the bungee cord to the bridge, might be 50%. And you didn't follow the weight limits. Thus, you are 30% negligent. I think that adds up to 100, right? So, if you were to bring suit against the bridge operator who provides the bungee cord jumping, your claim against them would be reduced by 70%. Excuse me, reverse that. Your claim against them would be reduced by 30% because you contributed that amount percentage-wise and comparatively speaking. When you see a comparative negligence jurisdiction, you will normally see the decision levied in percentages. So it's always a question of percentages when you're dealing with a comparative negligence jurisdiction. The final area of tort I want to talk about is product liability. And here we confront the strict liability tort standard. Product liability. When you purchase a product, you purchase it with the understanding 
that it in and of itself will not harm you in normal use. So if you buy a weed whacker and apply it to the weeds, you don't expect it to tear your feet off. But if you take the same weed whacker and decide you cut your kid's hair with it, that's not normal use. Thus, you're in violation of the usage of the product. And if you're harmed, you have no recourse because you did not use the product for the purpose for which it was supposed to be used. This is where you get all those very strange warnings. The content of this hot coffee cup may be hot. This plastic bag is not a toy for children. You run into these very strange um, warnings that are put on items to try to make the user use it for the proper use. Which always begs the question, who on earth did not expect the hot coffee to be hot? Who did not expect the child should not be playing with a plastic bag if they're too young to understand? Who, you know, unless you want a blue baby, God forbid. Now, the strict liability standard is the facts speak for themselves. Meaning, if you produce the product or you took part in a certain behavior, and there is a list of certain behaviors, if you take part in it and harm occurs, you don't have to question whether there's been a violation of the duty of care. You don't have to question whether it was intentionally done. You, the manufacturer of the good, the participant in that strictly liable activity, are guilty. You're liable, period. No questions asked. Now, you normally apply a strict liability standard to what's known as abnormally dangerous activities. The vicious dog, the dynamite producer, the fireworks producer. And you could see when injuries are done from fireworks, you see the gentleman f- ha- mo- almost half, half the time it happens to the hands and fingers, but it could happen to more. These are normally dangerous activities. These follow under a strict liability standard, meaning if harm occurs, the manufacturer is guilty, period. Okay? Now, how do you get a abnormally dangerous dog? According to New York law, all dogs are permitted two bites on two separate occasions, two bites, before you can have that dog put down. But there are exceptions. Rockweilers, German, uh, German Shepherds, Doberman Pinchers, and Pit Bulls are by definition dangerous. They are only permitted a one bite. Plus, their jaw strength is much stronger. Thus, they could apply a much more vicious bite than other breeds of dogs. So all dogs are allowed two bites before you could order that the dog be put down. Those four breeds, Doberman Pinchers, Rockweilers, German Shepherds, and Pit Bulls, are only allowed one bite. Okay? And that picture there kind of summarizes when poor Fido isn't that safe. They get a one bite rule. Well, I hope this helps. I hope you could persevere through this terrible voice. And this means tort law is at an end. We still have to go over the cases like we have to go over the cases from property law. But I appreciate you paying attention and taking copious notes. Thank you.